Hello, everyone. Before I introduce Benita Roy, I'd like to talk about our big plans for Parallax this fall. Starting in September, me and my friend Nils Skogland will be producing a series of courses we are calling Tools for Conviviality, named after a book by the late philosopher and social theorist Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich was a thinker for a time between worlds, or what he called a time of watershed. I know of only a handful of thinkers as prophetic and as prescient about the contemporary issues of school, medicine, language, and so-called machine intelligence and network thinking as Ivan Illich. But rather than study Illich directly, we will use his thinking as a prompt. Our ambition is to literally create tools for conviviality. Conviviality means, according to ChatGPT, the quality or state of being friendly, sociable, full of cheer and lively spirit. We should add adventure and learning. The series will be inaugurated by the wonderful Benita Roy. From her bio, Benita is a visioneer, insight guide, and horse whisperer. Her work is deeply embodied and grounded, and over the last several years, she's shown us how to trust the intelligence of life again. She is founder of Adalor Insight Center and curates wickedly provocative and seriously surprising conversations at the pop-up school. Her course, The Convivial Life Conversations with Ivan Illich and Friends, begins Sunday, September 3rd, and will continue every Sunday for the month of September. It will include pre-recorded lectures, live Zoom sessions, and campfire community sessions. For more information, and to join us in the learning and conviviality, please check the links below. And now, enjoy a short conversation in her course description. So the um, title of my course is, is The Convivial Life. It takes a, a, a larger kind of view of um, this notion of conviviality. And, um, and come on. And the subtitle is Conversations Between Ivan Illich and Friends. And this is because we're gonna use Ivan Illich as prompts because he's very provocative and he says things that kind of switch perspectives and shifts our idea of things. And, um, and then we're gonna bring in other voices that are more contemporary to see, well, where are we at? And how does Jan Zawicki talk about this or Timothy Morton talk about this? You know, what are these other voices that have come into um, the conversation since Ivan Ilyich? So, um, so we're gonna we're going to kind of uh, call these conversations into reality. Okay, so the course has four modules, and the first module um, is on education. The second modules will be the heart of uh, what you're talking about: tools, technology, and techne. Um, the third module will be on institutions and the production of subjectivity. And the last module will be on church and state. And you know, you can recognize that <laughs> Ivan Illich had a lot to say about all of these uh, topics. But during the course, we'll notice that what he has to say about institutions is reflected in what he has to say about education. What he has to say about tools, technology is reflected back in all of these categories. You know, everything in his work, he has a certain thematic presence so that these look like bullets that are, that, but they're not independent, they're not independent of each other. So we'll be able to get this sense that one thing leads and reflects back to the other. So in education, we're going to talk about something I call consumer education and, um, in, and invite his words into uh, what he thinks education is about. Uh, we're going to contrast that with village education. And then we're going to um, look at this proposition of um, saying without naming. So here we're inviting uh, the Dao Te Ching and Christopher Alexander into the conversation around education. So this is part of inviting friends into the conversation. 
In the second module, Tools, Technology, and Techne, we'll be talking about uh, Ilyich's notion of tools for conviviality, proportion, um, and human scale. Um, and then we're going to move it into something very contemporary conversation around the AI apocalypse um, and see if we can find in Ilyich uh, some prescience or warning or even possibility and opportunity. And then we're going to invite Timothy Morton in um, to have a conversation with us um, through his book, um, All Art is Ecological. Uh, so we'll talk about art and aesthetic reason. The next module is Institutions and the Production of Subjectivity. This is the third module. We're going to look at Ilyich's notion of people versus systems. We're going to look at the death of the communal self and the production of conviviality. So um, we'll talk a little, unpack these a little more in the next series of slides. And finally, the last module will be around this tension between church and state. Uh, we're going to cover politics and governance, the religious life, and the Good Samaritan, which was a huge guiding and anchoring uh, story or parable all the way through Ivan Illich's life. So we'll be inviting uh, actually E.E. E. Cummings in to talk with Ilyich about the Good Samaritan. So this is kind of the way um, the modules are set, set up, the, the four weekly modules. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the four modules and we are going to unpack, the, each module has three areas and now we're gonna look at the, unpack the three areas a little more just to give people a little more depth into uh, how the, um, what the, what the course outline is. This will also you know, be the outline that they can see on the website. <clears throat> okay, so we start with consumer education and we'll find out that the real purpose of education is elevate the consumer standards of each generation. This is a claim that Illich made and we'll look at some um, recent research by an economist, Brian Kaplan, who tries to figure out um, why uh, education is so expensive and comes to similar conclusions. Uh, so consumer education will become the human capital theory of the next decade as the global society transitions from economies based on labor and income to economies based on consumption and debt. So this will be carrying his idea forward. We're gonna look at some economies and I have a couple of brief art medium articles we can read on that. Then we'll talk about village education. And we'll talk about the ontological design of education is the ex extracurricular signal that will outlast the curricular content, right? So people have often said that when the industrial revolution happened, um, one of the things kids had to learn was to be on time, to sit in rows, to stay still for a long period of time. And this is the extracurricular content. And we'll talk, we'll work with Jan Zawicki, talk about like, what is it like to, you know, it, she, she teaches philosophy of, of environmental science. And, you know, she's always talking about nature and this and that, and yet she sits in this horrible classroom. So what is, there's this, there's this tension between the message and the environment, right? Uh, typical day in class, if it's a village education, would have the same sensory motor stimulation of a typical day sauntering through a village participating in the vibrant life of well-placed community, grounding the children in both a sense of belonging and place. So if you're trying to get a convivial society and a, a, a sense of community and friendship, and children are spending 90% of their time, their waking life in schools, which are not convivial and not like village-like, then you're working at odds to each other. The forces that you are training into the child are at odds with each other. So if you wanna, if we wanna make villages, we have to have education that's like a village. And then we'll look at this um, thing, uh, 
Um, it's an article that I wrote saying without naming, which uh, argues that educare means to bring forth more life. It's based on uh, something, uh, the work of Christopher Alexander. And it just says, we know that by saying we will capture just some, but not all, and perhaps, perhaps not much of what is possible to say. To say but not name means to keep open the past over possibilities through an artful use of language. So how can we design language so that, that what the teacher is not reifying and naming what is, but that it's much more dialogical and, 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 and lively. So this is not uh, something that is self-explanatory, but just kind of a preview of um, some of the cool stuff that we're gonna uh, get to in the education. Um, and as I said before, we're gonna invite Jacques Rancière uh, into the conversation with this uh, little text, The Ignorant Schoolmaster. It's very provocative. So that's the first module. We get to tools, technology, and technique. Uh, so we start with tools for conviviality. Um, Ivan Ilyich said, why shouldn't it be possible to think about objects of daily use as products of human intention and the use of appropriate tools? So the word appropriate here is very important. Um, and so we'll think about how he thought about tools. And then he said, it should be clear by this point that I think the, that modern technological society stands in the same relation to this discovery of tools as the death of nature does to the discovery of nature as a continuous and contingent creation. So on the one hand, he advocates for convivial tools, but then he says that modern technological society has a relationship to tools that has resulted in the death of nature. So this is very, you know, this is one of the things he says. He's extremely provocative because if you think he's making a case for tools, why would he make such a case against technology? So uh, this is him being a provocative. And then we're gonna look at some contemporary uh, um, <clears throat> conversations and debates and arguments and claims around the AI apocalypse. We'll already have heard how um, Iliad problematizes what is the inversion, the inversion of useful tools to worrisome technologies. Um, he said digital technology lacks instrumentality. It lacks the necessary distance between a tool and the user. He predicted the digital age and the end of the tool era. Um, so he's getting very provocative. He said, the hammer remains an instrument of the person, not the system. In a system, the user, the manager, logically, by the logic of the system, becomes part of the system. Therefore, I would strongly stress that within our lifetime, we have left the epoch during which the instrument dominated self-awareness, world awareness, and philosophical explanation of the world in language. And this is when he gets into talking about how we no longer have tools, we have systems that have us. So we'll look at that in another module. But then we're going to reclaim some uh, positive uh, spirit here. We're gonna look at art and aesthetic reason as an alternative to tools, technology, and techne. Well, this is the techne part. We're gonna uh, read a short little book if people have time, but we'll talk about it uh, by Timothy Morton called All Art is Ecological. Uh, I'll make it available in PDF form. Um, and this is what Timothy Morton says in his book, we'll be seeing how the experience of art provides a model for the kind of coexistence of ecological ethics and politics wants to achieve between humans and non-humans. Why is that? That's because beauty gives you a fantastic, impossible access to the inaccessible, to the withdrawn, open qualities of things, their mysterious reality. So we can see Timothy Morton as a contemporary interlocutor with, um, with Ivan Ilyich in, in, this, in this thing. And so Timothy Moore and all our, is ecological will be part of the conversation. In the third module, we're gonna talk about institutions and the production of subjectivity. This is the workshop. We're gonna do a lot of workshopping here where you're gonna actually fill out your own uh, um, trust network and your trust styles and, and the domains of care uh, through your own um, experience. 
and uh, we can share and contrast that. So this is where we get into um, people versus systems. That um, So here's something provocative that Illich said. The Gaia hypothesis takes on a gruesome meaning when it is used by someone who has been swallowed by the system to express his self-consciousness. So here's again, you might think, oh, Ivan Ilyich, he must love the Gaia hypothesis. But no, yet again, you know, he has all these kinds of ways of exiting that he surprises you, right? There's always these surprises. So this is something, this is the quote we'll use to be provocative, to, to, to ask these questions. So he writes, what the person who has himself been swallowed by the world conceived as a system, a world represented or made present to his fantasy in a disconnected but seductive sequence of visiotypes. So Bruno Latour has said this also in his Gifford lectures. He said, like, if you call it a vegetable, a giant machine or Gaia, it's the same violence because you're reducing the world to an object that you can manipulate in language. So that's what we'll be talking about here. Uh, death of the communal self, uh, at the core of the convivial society is the communal self generating networks of trust. Each one of us has a distinct trust styles that shift according to context and we'll be figuring out, finding out our trust styles by this workshop. We'll look at the production of conviviality. So <clears throat> uh, communities produce subjectivity by ontological design and all this. So how can we produce a convivial subject? Uh, the convivial society is constituted by the four domains of care. We'll workshop this, um, but we have the commons, which is non-reciprocal care plus shared spaces or places. The an economy in the kind of Wendell Berry sense of the world is reciprocal care plus a ledger, some kind of accounting system. A platform is disintermediated care plus a network. And a congregation is deep mutuality and shared assemblage, assembly. So these are the, this, this whole um, module will be workshopping these ideas in a hands-on sort of way. And we'll be looking at an expansion of Donald Oliver's um, model that our society has three overlapping spheres, the primal, uh, the vital, and the modern. And we'll look at expanding that into the hypothetical meta-modern. Um, so people, I think, will really um, uh, uh, grok, grok that. <clears throat> and I'll talk more about these in the pre-recorded videos. And so then when, once we get to the live uh, sessions, we, we can go through it and, and, and just have peer-to-peer uh, -peer conversations around it. And finally, the last module, church and state, we have politics and governance. So here's a provocative statement by Ivan Illich. Whenever I look for the roots of modernity, I find them in the attempts of the churches to institutionalize, legitimize, legitimize and manage Christian vocation. So he saw the, the emergence of Christian Europe as coming from the design, the political and governance design of the church, which of course came from Neoplatonism. So he wrote, Christian Europe is unmanageable with its deep concern about building institutions that take care of different types of people in need. So there is no question that modern service society is an attempt to establish and extend Christian hospitality. On the other hand, we have immediately perverted it. The personal freedom to choose who will be my other has been transformed into the use of power and money to provide a service. This not only deprives the idea of the neighbor of the quality of freedom implied in the story of the Samaritan, it also creates an impersonal view of how a good society ought to work. It creates needs, so-called, for service commodities, needs which can never be satisfied. Is there enough health yet, enough education? and therefore a type of suffering completely unknown outside of Western culture with its roots in Christianity. So this is a very severe um, critique of not only the world he lived in, but a big warning, like what are we doing in this time between worlds? Are we satisfying needs that actually are iatrogenetic and they actually cause a new kind of suffering 
that the world has never seen before. So like there's a, you know, he's got a, an, an intense mind and, and an amazing um, gift for perspectival shifts. Uh, so this is, the, again, these are prompts that we, we will be working with for having conversations. Then the religious life. Uh, <clears throat> Here's another cool perspectival shift. And, and this is where we can talk about some of these religious uh, movements, cross movements in our community. How is it that Jewish people came into existence around, oh, around their prophets? It says prophets, but it means prophets. Um, so he, he says, what makes the ancient Jews unique is that they became a social we, an I in the plural, around the message that whatever happens in history, or could be seen in nature as a foreshadowing in the sense that pregnancy foreshadows birth. And I thought this was very provocative because it kind of pings on something Jordan Hall said in, in Vermont, and that is that to become a we, it has to do something with religion. And this is the question that you see Ilyich being fascinated with. The prophets of Israel made the astonishing claim that they could step outside the family, so get outside of that, uh, that structure and step out of the tribal context in which tomorrow turns in a circle with yesterday. So students of Gebser will notice that prior to the modern age, the cycle of family and tribal was cyclical. And the, these prophets, and I would argue the Neoplatonists, they, they had this claim that they could speak about a tomorrow that they could be visionaries outside of these cycles, which would be totally surprising. And this is what we know as messianic. And so it's a re kind of definition of the religious life. And finally, uh, the Good Samaritan, uh, God didn't become man, he became flesh. And we were talking about this, and this is real juicy stuff that we end with. Uh, I believe in a God who is enfleshed, and who has given the Samaritan as a being drowned in carnality, the possibility of creating a relationship by which an unknown chance encounter becomes for him the reason for his existence as he becomes the reason for the other's survival, not just in a physical sense, but a deeper sense as a human being. God's love is in the flesh and the relationship between two people. The mystery of the Samaritan is inevitably a mystery of the flesh. This becomes very difficult to explain or even to say in our generation during which I believe an extraordinary process and an extraordinary history of disenfleshment of our perceptions, concepts, and our senses has reached a high point. So um, yeah, those are mouthfuls, but I think you get the sense of what we're attempting to do here.